Today's episode is brought to you by Domain.com. This is incredibly right. physically demanding. <laughs> <laughs> Action, Baron. Hi, I'm Seth Worley. Welcome to the behind the scenes of Real Gone, my contribution to Film Riot's epic summer. If you haven't seen the film yet, be sure to go to the link below. Otherwise, you're going to find out that he dies at the end way before you should. I actually outline all of my movies like a clock. So for like a 10 minute film, if you look at a clock, the three minute mark would be about two minutes and 30 seconds. The six o'clock mark would be about uh, five minutes and the nine o'clock mark would be about seven minutes and 30 seconds. I found that a lot of good stories fall into this template really well. And if you start to trace story threads around the clock, you start to notice some symmetry. For example, let's look at Raiders of the Lost Ark. So here's what I do. I start with a clock. A two hour movie, the 30 minute mark would be at about three o'clock. The one hour mark would be about six o'clock and the hour and a half mark would be at about nine o'clock. The act breaks tend to fall around the same places, right above that three hour mark and that nine hour mark. So let's track Marion's timeline. Here's where Marion is first mentioned. Here's where she enters the story, bringing us into act two. Here's where she punches Indy, implying a history. Here's where she seemingly dies in the truck explosion. Here's where we discover she's alive, but Indy leaves her in Belloc's tent so as not to raise suspicion. Here's where we pick back up with her in Belloc's tent. Here's where she's thrown into the well of souls with Indy and they work together to escape. Here's where she kisses Indy for the first time in the film. And here's where the Nazis board the submarine and take her and the Ark, pushing us into act three. Here's where Indy decides not to blow up the Ark and her. You notice a pattern here? There's symmetry showing up. Like, even look at this, my favorite one is, here's where Marion punches him, and here's where she kisses him. Here's where Sala enters the film. Here's where Sala exits the film. And let's do one more. Here's where the arc is introduced into the story, and we see an illustration of it being opened, and it's insinuated that terrible things happen when it's opened. Here's where Indy discovers the exact location of the arc, and here's where Indy finds the arc, and here's where the arc is opened, and we see terrible things happen when it's opened. So outlining a story like this actually allows me to drop in all of the loose ideas that I have and then fill in the blanks by extracting story threads from what I already have. So while I was writing it, I was simultaneously compiling a lookbook full of images from films and shows like True Detective, Breaking Bad, some Coen Brothers films. Not only so I could stay focused on the tone that I was trying to establish for the film, but I could also send it to my director of photography, Chris Adams, so we could know and start planning what kind of gear we needed for the shoot. And I could send it to my producer, Ann Fogarty, as she looked for locations and props so that we had overall a cohesive production design on the film. I usually try to storyboard every scene of the film because they're short films, it's easier to storyboard every scene. But on this film, we ran out of time and so I focused only on key scenes, specifically the fire scene at the end. There were several reasons for this. One, I knew that it was gonna be a visual effects heavy scene and I was gonna need to know exactly what plates to get. I also knew logistically it was gonna be very complicated with ambulances and smoke and extras. I also knew that it was the one scene that we didn't have very much time to get. And on top of all of that, I knew that it was gonna be probably the most dramatically heavy scene of the film and I wanted to make sure that we got all the coverage we needed to be able to find that right tone and editing. But we'll get more into that in a later episode. My storyboards are pretty indecipherable to everyone else so I stopped trying to make them decipherable a long time ago. They're basically just geometric shapes and scratches and even some blood. I sketched up all my storyboards in these really cool notebooks I found from Muji that I have no idea what their actual intent is but they're perfect for storyboarding. And I'll take pictures of them with my iPhone and bring them into Shot Lister which I like to keep with me at all times on set so as I reference throughout the day how much we've gotten done and how much we still have to get done. I also have my storyboards easily accessible for myself and for anyone else who wants to look at pictures of circles and lines. Domain.com is where you want to be if you're an inventor, an innovator, or an entrepreneur of any kind. They have a ton of domain extensions, a list of 200 plus and growing extensions like .ninja, .expert, .cc, .nyc, and all sorts of other ones for you to use to really push your brand. And we could save you money by using the coupon code FILMRIGHT at checkout. You can save 20% off your domain names, your web hosting, and your email. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. So our plan was to shoot for two days, Saturday and Sunday. Our star Darren lives in Washington, D.C., and so we only had him for the weekend. Chris and I agreed that actually that Friday would be a good opportunity to go shoot with no crew and get a lot of these cutaway shots that we were worried would slip through the cracks. These scenes included the hanging scene, the cutaways in the montage to like gasoline and the jumper cables and the motor oil. So while we had all this prep going into Saturday and Sunday, 
We got to Friday morning and didn't have any locations nailed down for these shots we were gonna get. Ryan landed in Nashville that morning and we went and got breakfast. And it was sitting at breakfast that I got the idea for a friend of mine who owns a company that's located in a kind of industrial area of Nashville. It's so hard not to like Wes Anderson, these kind of shots, like one shot jokes. Like an old new and everything, like in on this too, it's like, my immediate thought is okay, put him in front of a flat background and just have him, you know, center him in frame. But it's like, no, it's gonna be more interesting. Yeah. This could work for the gasoline or the jumper cables. I think the jumper cables could happen right here. Do that for the gasoline, this for the jumper cables. That for the hanging. And then I just need motor oil. This is a kind of last minute thrown together. We're not supposed to start shooting until tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday, today's Friday. Uh, in about 30 minutes, I'm going to pick up Darren, the lead actor at the airport. We'll have an hour or two to actually like try on his entire wardrobe, decide on looks for every scene and shot, and then, uh, and makeup, and then um, come out here to this parking lot and do three or four throwaway gags that we don't want to cut, but we don't have time to shoot over the weekend. Darren just landed in Nashville, and we, uh, we're here in Ryan Connolly's hotel room, uh, watching him change clothes. Um, filming him changing clothes. <laughs> I bought a bunch of clothes from Goodwill, the saddest clothes I could find. We're figuring out our various uh, outfits that we need for each scene, breaking it down into specific looks so that we can then keep our props organized in that way. And I can say to Darren, hey, you're in main one or main two, and he knows what outfits to put on. We're trying to make him look interesting, like interestingly sad and, and kind of unnoticeable, but at the same time, we don't want him to be like a too Dwight Schrute, too much of like a caricature. We don't want him to look like a Pixar character walking around in the real world. You know, we want him to look like you know the Pixar character walking around a Pixar world, or a real character walking around the real world. I'm gonna teach you how to tie a noose. So we got to the shoot and it started raining. And after it started raining, it started hailing. And the thing is, I said this on set and I'll say it now, I've never shot a good film in good weather. I think every film that I've ever been proud of was shot in weather that was some kind of uncomfortable. Fortunately for us, the rain didn't last very long, so it was smooth sailing from that point on. Except one minor problem. We could not get that rope over that light pole. We decided that it would be easy to just overlay that rope in over the wide shots, and for the close-ups, have Ben standing off screen with a pole, hanging the rope down in, and Darren can interact with the real rope. Now, the pole was originally part of the plan, and the reason for this was safety. I didn't want Darren ever putting a rope around his neck that was also attached to another solid object. So the plan was always to have Ben standing off screen with a pole, with the rope attached to it loosely, so Darren could put the rope around his neck, and if he were to slip and fall or anything were to happen, he'd bring that light pole down with him. There would never be any tension in that rope. And it was important because we didn't have a stunt team, we didn't have anything like that, so we needed to be as safe as possible. For the shots of his feet knocking the ladder over, we just scooted the ladder over toward the dumpster and had him sit and put his weight on the dumpster so that he could swing his feet back and forth and remain hanging there once the ladder fell. Once we knocked out the hanging scene, we moved on to the motor oil shots. Now for this, we wanted to see Darren chugging the thermos full of orange juice and motor oil, but we obviously didn't want to risk Darren actually putting motor oil into his system. So what we did was we first we filled up that thermos with orange juice before we ever opened the motor oil and we filmed him chugging that orange juice out of that clean thermos. Then once we got that shot, we went and got the shots that preceded it uh, with Darren pouring the motor oil and orange juice into the thermos. And then when he cut it in the order that we did, it looks just like he's chugging that motor oil. Side note, we thought it was motor oil, turns out it's transmission fluid, which is equally as terrible. We had plenty of time to get the jumper cable shot, and then we were to move on to the gasoline shot, but I decided that since it was the coldest it was gonna be the entire weekend, and I was gonna put Darren through a lot of misery. Ah! It's a little cold, it's a little cold. Is that literal dirt that you got from the ground? I just didn't think it was a good idea to have Darren pour freezing cold water on himself in the freezing cold weather wearing only a hospital gown. We decided instead to shoot that the next day at the apartment in the shower, and it turned out great. Action.
and cut. Alright, so move on. Dude, what is this? <laughs> Water from the Arctic Ocean? <laughs> <laughs> So then we miraculously ended up with extra time to be able to drive down the road and shoot in that store parking lot. And when we got to the parking lot, I remember pulling in and looking over at Chris, and we both had the same thought. We had driven through a tunnel on the way there that looked awesome. We both agreed we needed to go back and shoot at least one shot of Darren walking home through that awesome tunnel. We tried to shoot this as quick and as unintrusive as possible since we didn't have a film permit or permission to really even be there in the parking lot. This first day was interesting because it wasn't part of the original plan uh, and it was interesting contrast to the rest of the weekend. The rest of the weekend we had a really great crew and we had all these official locations with you know permission to be there uh, and food and everything else. And this first day felt a lot like a lot of other shoots we do where there's no crew, no safety, no money, no nothing. And it went just as smoothly as the rest of the weekend did. I was excited that we managed to get all these tiny cutaway gags that honestly we wouldn't have been able to fit into the weekend. Since we were able to grab all this awesome stuff that I thought we were gonna lose, we were able to move into the official shoot uh, with overall good feelings. More on those good feelings next week.